Hallo. You can start. Okay. Um, thank you. Good morning. Greetings to all participants on behalf of the uh, Faculty of Economics and Business and the Tax Education and Research Center, Universitas of Indonesia. It is uh, my great honor to welcome you all to our tax research sharing session. Um, as you know, this is our regular uh, event that's been held every three months and we invite prominent scholars uh, to talk about uh, tax research or uh, some like fundamental ideas about um, tax uh, education and research. Uh, so please join me today to welcome Professor Adrian Sawyer from UC Business School, University of Canterbury, New Zealand, who will deliver a seminar titled Who Cares About Tax Theory and Why? I think that's a really uh, important and interesting question, especially for us educators and researchers in taxation. Um, so Professor Adrian will um, deliver this talk uh, after some opening speech uh, from our head of the um, LPM, um, Buryatu. Uh, and then after that, uh, we will directly start the, uh, the workshop. So I will, I will be your uh, moderator and as well as the MC. Uh, so, uh, we will we will have a Q and A and discussion session after the after the talk. Okay, Buhiatu, uh, the time is yours. Uh, thank you, uh, Yuli. Uh, good morning, uh, Professor Adrian. Uh, good morning as well, uh, Ibu Yuli, Chair of Accounting Department, Faculty of Economics and Business, Universitas Indonesia, and my colleague Christine, Coordinator of the TRC. TRC uh, in uh, FABUE. Uh, welcome to all of you, uh, friends, colleagues, uh, students who are joining today tax research uh, sharing session. On behalf of LPM, uh, we would like to thank you especially for Ibu Yuli uh, and Ibu Christine uh, who continue support and initiating this tax research uh, sharing session. Thank you also, Professor Adrian. Uh, we are delighted to have you here. Uh, I think this is not the first time. Uh, the first time for you to uh, joining uh, joining activity from uh, TRC as well. Uh, we are delighted uh, and happy that you will share uh, with us your research on taxation in curriculum of higher education and involvement of research on taxation. Uh, as an overview as well, uh, LPM hosted Tax Education and Research Center, Faculty of Economics and Business, University of Indonesia. We are supporting uh, the knowledge sharing on research and policy updates on taxation policies conducting by TRC in collaboration with various partners in the Faculty of Economics and Business and external partners. This regular forum of research tax sharing session has been supported by the Department of Accounting and currently as well by the research cluster on taxation. Uh, this TRRS is started in 2018 when TRRC also uh, established with a background that there is still limited research discussion in Indonesia on taxation and uh, surely uh, uh, it it will need more of the collaboration given various policies development in this field in Indonesia regional and global context. I am excited to joining uh, this forum and listening to your research, Professor Adrian. And uh, hopefully we are, uh, uh, we are all uh, will uh, from the discussion will also lead uh, and initiate uh, new ideas and collaboration uh, among us. Uh, to all of you, enjoy uh, the discussion. Thank you. Back to you, uh, Yuli. Thank you. And thank you, Buryatu, for the opening and uh, the introduction of the seminar. Uh, so I think we can move to our um, main, um, main, main talk today, uh, given by Adrian. So I just want to remind everybody, all the participants, to mute your microphone. So if you have any questions for Adrian, you can uh, 
type it on the chat box and I will read the questions after the talk. Uh, but later on, if we still have time, then maybe you can ask Adrian in person. But for um, during the talk, so just please be mindful to uh, silent your microphone so we can focus on um, the discussion. And if you have anything that you want to um, ask or you want to uh, say about the talk, then please use the chat box to uh, write your comments. Okay, so uh, without further ado, Adrian, the time is yours. So I will, I will, I will share the screen for the slides. Okay, well. Good afternoon for me. Good morning to everybody who's here. Thank you very much, um, Yulin Riatu, for the kind words of introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to be able to uh, deliver this seminar today. Um, earlier on, I had sent through a copy of the paper from which this presentation is based. So that's um, available for... Um, anybody who wants to um, have a look at this in a bit more detail. So as mentioned, the topic is sort of a little bit uh, provocative by saying who cares about tax theory and why. And also I'm looking at the issue of tax discipline or disciplines within um, academia. So as I said, this is based on a published paper and I will um, update in a few places in the presentation um, things that have happened since the um, paper was published um, a few years ago. So next slide, please. Okay, so the the structure that I'm going to follow is a little bit of an introduction. Then I'm going to, well, I've entitled it Literature Review, but as you'll see, it's not a literature review as you would see in a typical paper, because <clears throat> in a way this is... Um, reflections upon looking at um, two key aspects that are that are vital to us as um, academics or, or even as you are a graduate student or something that is the role of teaching and research. So I will sort of loosely do a literature review. Then I'm going to look at this through two uh, perspectives, a teaching perspective, and I've entitled it there tax discipline because one of the issues to think about um, is whether, in fact, tax is a discipline in its own right. And that's something we can, I'll talk about a bit more. Then I'll look at it through a research perspective. And after going through each of those, I'll bring together some observations and then there'll be, I'm planning on leaving plenty of time for questions and comments that you might have. And you can see at the bottom of the screen, the details there of the article from which it was based. It was published in 2018 in the um, New Zealand Journal of Taxation, Law and Policy. And if you look at the little picture on the side there, when I originally um, presented this some years ago, it was presented in a Australasian context. And that's why you'll see there's quite a bit in this focusing on um, Australia and New Zealand. Okay, next slide, please. Okay. So some introductory uh, comments or thoughts to get us underway today. Um, <clears throat> something that, um, and looking at a lot of published research and reflecting on my time um, as an academic is tax, particularly as time's gone on, doesn't really fit within a particular discipline. So what I'm sort of trying to say there is you can't say, well, tax is say, a branch of accounting or tax is a branch of law or something like that. It, clearly has um, some interaction in those areas, aspects of it can fit in those disciplines, but it doesn't neatly um, fit into any particular discipline. So that raises my, the first question is, well, and as we'll talk more about, is tax itself um, a discipline? Yet a comment was made um, back in 1943 in the case of Dobson and the Commissioner, where the um, court said there that no other branch of the law touches human activity so at so many points as does tax law. Now, obviously, this was take, this was a court case, and so it's not entirely um, a surprise that the focus of this was obviously looking at tax from the legal perspective. So 
this then sort of sets the groundwork for asking one of the fundamental questions is, well, what is a discipline? And in the Oxford Dictionary, it says that a discipline is a branch of knowledge, typically one studied in higher education. So, you know, if you're, in, if you're working in a university, that's um, a very common uh, type of institution, which we'd call higher education. And so it's suggesting that this is a, a branch of knowledge. And then it goes on to provide an example saying that sociology is a fairly new discipline. So I guess many of us would have an idea what sociology is. And so the dictionary suggests that that is a discipline rather than um, being with, um, entirely within some discipline. So when we look at this from a tax perspective, um, a number of people would say, well, OK, tax is, doesn't fit into one discipline, but it isn't necessarily a discipline in itself. It's more of a specialisation, and particularly a specialisation that you will see people will take on board or work with in particularly the legal or law, discipline of law, or the accounting discipline. And so uh, particularly in uh, higher education institutes, you will usually see taxation sitting in either the law faculty or the business school within accounting, or sometimes in both. But it's seen as a specialisation rather than in itself existing. And another way you might look at that is within accounting, you might say there's financial accounting, management accounting, auditing, etc. They might be specialisations within the broad framework of accounting. Um, Lamb in 2005 uh, made this uh, statement, which obviously is something we need to think about, is that tax is not a discipline in itself but rather is a multidisciplinary field of research or a clustering of research interest. Now, this piece of work is focusing on the research side, so um, there's no direct linking this to the teaching of tax, but is arguing that it's a multidisciplinary field of research. And if you have taken some time, we've had some experience, you will know that you can look at tax from many different broad disciplines. For example, you can look at it from accounting, law, psychology, sociology, economics, history, etc. So clearly there is evidence that there's a lot of different disciplines that have an impact on tax, but the crucial thing is going to be is, is tax in itself a discipline that is influenced by other disciplines? And so the question that I've sort of added there, and I'd encourage you to think about it, and maybe you want to ask a question or share your thoughts at the end, is, is this still the case in 2022? That is, Tax is not a discipline, but is a multidisciplinary field of research. Okay. And that draws upon the next point on that slide, that tax benefits from contributions from many disciplines. However, if you think about it from an undergraduate student perspective, they probably see tax as clearly having an influence on law, where they look at maybe statutes, regulations, cases. They may also see it from an accounting perspective because you have to account for um, your transactions, which might lead to tax implications. And maybe if they've had a wider experience, they'll see the influence of economics. They might see the influence of history, philosophy, political science, psychology, public policy, sociology, etc. And the more you immerse yourself in uh, the research that goes on in tax, and to some degree, uh, where it might be taught, the more you become aware that it is highly influenced by many other disciplines or areas which of themselves aren't focused on tax, but they clearly have um, an impact on how we go about interpreting or applying tax. And another point for us to think about is that in many ways, and this may vary depending on the country you're in, the age of your university, et cetera, that the way we go about our teaching and research is often a product of academic tradition. So, um, and I'll talk more about this a bit later on, but um, in some countries, for example, the way that tax might be taught, it might have been perceived as being in the domain of law. And so you'll see most of it happening there. In some places, you might see more of it happening in some other discipline, or you might see it, for example, happening within accounting. And the two little figures that I've put up there, um, some of you might be recall these or have seen these in your research or readings, which is 
Going back to particularly to Australia and then to New Zealand, what led to what was called the compliance model for taxpayer behaviour? And the first one there shows that there's a number of influences on taxpayers, such as business, industry, sociological, economic, psychological. So that's one way of showing that if you look at it from a taxpayer perspective, many things influence the way they may behave. And then the, the second one there is what was known as the compliance pyramid, which looks at dividing taxpayers' attitudes to compliance between being willing to up to those who do not wish to comply. And on the other side is the degree to which you um, will apply um, pressure or um, emphasis on trying to deal with taxpayers. So those that are not wanting to comply, you need to take a, a firmer action versus those who want to comply, you try and make it as easy as possible. So that's an example of models that come from outside of taxation that have been highly influential in the past, at least, in shaping decisions about how revenue authorities work, in some degree on how you develop legislation, how you, what sort of powers, penalties, or whatever you want to put in place. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, having said that as a, a bit of an introduction, I'm going to briefly cover what most of you would expect would come after an introduction, which is your literature review. And as I said earlier, there is not really a literature review because very rarely, and I haven't really seen this occur in the tax area, do you see studies that basically talk about concepts such as what is a discipline theory and things like that, that you could go back and look at in the area of tax. <clears throat> so there aren't really any specific prior studies that I could directly take on point for this paper. So what I've rather done is look at what has been talked about within the two broad hearing, headings sorry, of teaching perspectives and research perspectives. And that's what I'm shortly going to cover in the, in the next series of slides. But one of the things that flows through some of this and something that sparked my interest in the area Wow. was when you might have communications with people, particularly outside of taxation, um, and you, you start talking about their discipline and you might say, well, you know, my areas are the discipline of tax. And some of them will say to you, but that's not really a discipline. That's just part of accounting or part of law. And so then you either choose to let it go or maybe have a discussion about them. And then if you can convince them that tax is a discipline, um, that is, you know, a, a, a basically an organised area, a group of um, knowledge that we'd usually see taught in higher education institutions. We can then ask a question, how far is it from maturity? And if you have a look across in the wee diagram there, which is a um, one uh, drawing of looking at what we know as our STEM subjects, which you probably, um, at least in my institution and many others, you hear a lot about that science and technology, engineering, maths are uh, the real core advanced um, disciplines. But some of them recognise that they're also informed by other areas. For example, um, arts may um, provide some sort of input as well. But what this diagram is, is trying to show that through content, various areas, all of this in some way comes together and has an influence or shapes upon what we might teach our students or what we might use in our research. So coming back to this from a tax perspective, one of the things that um, became fairly clear to myself and is a challenge always to be working with is we need to, if we are working within tax, we need to offer convincing arguments to the wider debate, debate as to whether tax is a discipline, not just sort of brush it aside or um, feel as though we've got inadequate reasons to be able to compare ourselves, as they say, to more traditional areas? Or do we at least start and acknowledge and provide evidence that it's a multidisciplinary subject which may be headed towards being accepted as a discipline or in its very um, earlier stages? And realistically, the issue about is tax a discipline, et cetera, is a much bigger issue when it comes from a research perspective rather than a teaching perspective because most colleagues, wherever they are, acknowledge that if you are teaching accountants, 
they need to know something about tax. So it fits in there. If you're teaching lawyers and they want to do commercial law, then there should be something about tax in there. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so I'm now going to start to offer some perspectives of the tax discipline, as I'm accepting at least provisionally, it could be a discipline, from a teaching perspective. One of the earlier studies that I found was by Lazar in 1970, and this probably is reflective of some of the earlier days, where tax was basically seen as a branch of law, something that would be key for lawyers, and accountants only need to be given limited training. Now, this that's a comment that comes from the US, and some of the comments on this slide are taking a US perspective, where to be fair, in terms of many jurisdictions in the world, the US is very different. Different in a number of ways from a teaching perspective. Yes, the AICPA, American Institute of Certified Practicing Accountants, they have a what's called a model tax curriculum that um, is expected to be followed for those that are wanting to become um, CPAs. And the core components there is that you need to cover the role of taxation and economic decision making and financial reporting. So that's sort of suggesting it's something that supports other areas, but more importantly, cover the fundamental tax laws and the essential tax planning concepts and make sure students are aware of the breadth of existing tax issues and their impact on a variety of tax paying entities. So in some respects, it's, um, can you drop back to the previous slide, please? Thank you. Yeah, so in some respects, um, this is suggesting that tax is really just supporting other areas or disciplines, but it also says that there's quite a lot in itself that is core knowledge. Now, in the US, unlike most countries in the world, um, tax is a major component in many law schools, and law is a postgraduate qualification. That is, a student already has to have done an undergraduate degree, and then they may go to a law school to do uh, what's called a JD, which is like what we would call a um, LLB degree in um, Commonwealth countries. And they might do a specialist master's degree, LLM, or even do a doctorate, which is an SJD, which is a doctor of juridical science. That's the particular degree that I have as my doctorate that I did from a University of Virginia in the US. Now, these law schools that focus on tax, they have a very comprehensive program, usually six to eight courses, and may even offer a specialist tax LLM. And that becomes a crucial component if you want to be involved in high level tax practice. Because in the US, something was aware when I was there, is most of the big tax work uh, is done by lawyers, not accountants, unlike most other countries where most of the tax work is, big tax work is done by accountants and not lawyers. Now, the American Bar Association, which is the main body that regulates practicing lawyers, um, they continue to recommend that there should be more experiential learning undertaken by students, and this should be part of taxation courses and programs. So rather than just teaching students knowledge, et cetera, they should be encouraging students to be able to experience to see how this might actually work. And a little bit more recently, um, some American authors Fikali has said, Al said that more international tax is needed in undergraduate accounting programs. Um, and this was said well before the BEPS environment that we have now. And I'm sure anyone who knows anything about BEPS know that uh, it's probably the biggest issue that's going around in tax at the moment. And it's vital that students have some awareness of it. OK, next slide, please. OK, so that was a US perspective. Looking at this now from a UK and then a Australian and New Zealand perspective. Um, a study by Craner and Limer in 2005, again, a few years ago, they found that tax courses generally are optional for students and done in the last year of their degree, and that professional bodies do not mandate a tax paper. So quite a different um, approach to the US. Now, I'm aware that there's some other authors currently at the moment who are looking to do a more recent study um, across UK universities to see where taxes, et cetera. So the, uh, hopefully in the next year or so, there'll be an update. They also pointed out that a lot of these courses took on a computational focus. They actually suggested it was a bias. That is, a lot of it was about calculating numbers, and they questioned, is that 
appropriate? Is that the right balance? Should we be looking more at concepts and application, or should it be about making sure students can calculate um, the amount of tax in different situations? They pointed out that traditional teaching techniques we use, which is, as we would understand at a lecture, someone standing up there and talking and students there passively um, following it. At that point in time, there was very little use of computers, uh, but we know that things have changed quite considerably since then. So a very traditional tax having a very minor and in some cases virtually no influence on um, undergrad students. Looking at from an Australian and New Zealand perspective around a similar time, um, McCurcher in Australia, looking at the University of Sydney, um, the university there was taking a research-led teaching focus. So one of the focus some universities have taken is let research inform your teaching. So what's happening out there? Where are things developing? Bring that into your teaching. And academics were encouraged and, I guess, in some ways, rewarded to incorporate their research into the curriculum um, and to, if possible, actually engage students in the research. So that would obviously be very, a very much experiential form of learning. So very different there than what was happening in the UK. Um, Tan and Veal in New Zealand did a study across New Zealand universities. And what they found is that the universities emphasized a conceptual understanding, uh, much more than technical pro proficiency on the basis that technical proficiency you can learn when you're out working, but getting students to understand concepts, how they interact, why they're there, policy choices was more important. And driving this at the time was the influence of the professional accrediting bodies, that is the professional accounting associations, um, saying these are the sorts of things that we want graduates to have. And also in New Zealand, unlike the US, is that academics have a much closer relationship, and I believe to a large degree, this is still the case with the profession than is the case in the US. And that's a lot easier, I guess, in New Zealand with 5 million people compared to maybe 330, 340 million um, people in the US. So the takeaway from that is there is quite a different approach in um, different areas or parts of the world. Okay, next slide, please. Now, another area that's come up more recently, and this is a good example of teaching and research coming together, is what's known as the Scholarship of Learning and Teaching, teaching or SALT. And Brett Frudenberg at Griffiths University in a paper made a very interesting quote, which I've set out here, um, where he says, good teaching is of itself not enough in modern university environments. Increasingly, academics are being asked to provide evidence of learning and teaching outcomes and also to be engaged in what's called the scholarship of teaching. The scholarship of teaching and of learning and teaching is seen as one way of providing evidence of learning and teaching outcomes. So by engaging in the SALT, academics can be more active agents. This can have beneficial implications in terms of their teaching and of student learning, but can also raise their research profile. So while academics may have strong discipline knowledge, many academics may have limited knowledge of theories of learning and strategies of teaching. However, it is argued that even these excellent teachers would benefit from engaging with SALT. So what he's outlining here is, and I'm not sure about universities in Indonesia, but this is also true universities in New Zealand, there's a greater emphasis now on providing evidence of how students are actually learning and what's working for them, what's not working for them. And you've been able to provide evidence, particularly, for example, if you want to apply for a research grant money or you want to apply for promotion or something like that. You can't just say you've done this or the students, whatever. You need to provide some evidence. And one good way to do this is to be able to actually have undertaken some research and showing and having clear evidence of how your students have actually um, learnt um, and been able to benefit from your teaching. And if you get involved in this area, um, Frudenberg argues, you're also going to bolster your research because you'll be publishing some of this in journals. But one of the key issues, as I've got in the last bullet point there, is this is going to require you to be familiar with the relevant theories that would apply with teaching and learning. And to be fair, I would imagine most um, legal or accounting academics 
are not familiar with the theories involved with learning and teaching. Um, you need to be familiar with the methodologies and the choices you have and the particular dissemination outputs, not just within the disciplines of accounting, law or tax, but particularly within the discipline of education. And so that's a whole new group of people, a whole new way of learning to engage with others and adding to what already you need to be doing in taxation. So this is an emerging field and no doubt research that occurred prior to the COVID pandemic will have to be re-looked at because I'm sure we're all familiar with the fact that the way students learn and their approach is, is very different during these pandemic and potentially in the post-pandemic times. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, another study undertaken by uh, Diane Crow in 2017, so reasonably recent here, was looking at um, how tax laws taught particularly to um, business students and also to law students and focusing, this is focusing principally on Australia. So in terms of teaching to business students, um, her study showed that it could be done by academics or practitioners. So sometimes it's students are not even getting the benefit of an academic who's rigorously, cha rigorous, rigorously changed in, uh, and learned how to uh, be an effective teacher and undertake research, but people who are much more practitioner focused. And sometimes these would even not be academics from a business school, they could even come from a law faculty. Um, however, if we're talking about law students, it was almost always by law school teachers, but so occasionally by practitioners. So again, depending on where you learnt your tax, you could have a different uh, perspectives provided to you. In terms of teaching methods used, they, they were the fairly standard ones, could be either dissemination of basic legal principles, based on case law, that is technical, rational knowledge, inductive application of legal principles to given scenarios, and practicum exercises to address everyday problems of, for example, legal tax practice that draw on tacit and explicit knowledge. And so in relation to this, Crowell says that law schools use normally the first two methods. So either they focus on, they focus on principles based on case law, or they apply principles to scenarios. Um, and implicitly, they're recognizing that knowledge is valid if it's based on a theory, although they may not go into that in much detail. But business schools tend to be more broad in terms of the methods that they use. So they will also bring in the third method of using practicums, and that might be through the types of assignments they do, might be through internships or other different methods. Um, found that business schools can be found in research and non-research universities. Um, <clears throat> although research universities are known to emphasize methods one and two over method three, the concern being that method three might suggest it's too practical and doesn't really have enough um, development of knowledge or is uh, basically, it's not immersed enough in traditional approaches and methods. So one of the things that I drew out of some of these studies is that it's really important as an academic, or even if you're a postgrad student and you're going to go into an academic career or at least a research career or some type of teaching, is to reflect on your teaching, on how others teach. Think about abandoning some old habits. And I think COVID-19 for most people has forced quite a big change in what we do. And try and think creatively about what methods are appropriate for classroom environment. And the bit that I've added since is in the paper, because obviously at the time the paper was published, we didn't have the pandemic, is how has or what has been the impact of COVID on teaching? And I think in many cases, it's moved away from face-to-face -to, -face to online in different formats. It's led to, in many ways, a lot less direct student engagement and having to find different ways to ensure that um, students are still engaging and learning. So by no means do I think we've seen the last of some of the changes that um, the pandemic is likely to have. Okay, next slide, please. So I did a little bit of a, a look across for the paper of where were um, staff and what sort of courses were offered. And this is at a very high 
level. So I didn't delve into um, the particular institutions. But generally speaking, if you're in Australia, tax is taught in business and law schools with a relatively consistent coverage of topics. So not a huge difference. But um, where there were institutions with a larger concentration of tax staff, such as University of New South Wales, University of Melbourne, University of Sydney, they would tend to have more courses and they would often offer specialist master's degrees in tax. Across the New Zealand universities, all of them have at least one paper and three of them, Auckland, Victoria University of Wellington and Canterbury, where I am, um, all have tax major and Auckland has a specialist master's of tax program which accepts students from all around the country. In terms of some Asian countries, um, and again, um, this is only a handful. <coughs> In the paper, I considered Hong Kong and Singapore. Um, and for the presentation, um, I did a preliminary look, and I'm happy to be corrected at the end if I've not got this right. But um, in Hong Kong, you would see tax in both business and law faculties. And my experience, because I've often been a visitor, the University of Hong Kong, I've given seminars to the law faculty there, although quite often you'll see business people there. In Singapore, it tended to be more in the business faculties or schools than law, and the same I've tended to find for um, Indonesia. If you look at Europe, and one example I found there was in the Netherlands, you would find most of the tax was actually done in the law faculties and not in the business schools. In the UK, there is quite a mix between business and law faculties, variable concentrations, but as was said earlier, and it's still largely true, Unless you're a larger institution, you would be lucky to have one academic who might teach a tax paper, but they would also have to teach other areas. So they often weren't a specialist tax person. They might have been a specialist in some other area, but also taught the single tax paper. As I said earlier, and just coming back to in North America, um, if, we, if we look at um, USA, it's very different than everywhere else where you're focusing particularly that taxes offered in a postgraduate environment uh, through the JD or people from around the world might come and do the specialist LLM. It is taught to some degree in business schools and Canada is a mix. Um, generally speaking, and this is a high generalisation, if there was uh, one course, you would tend to see a focus on core legislation and case law. If there was more than one course, then you might see other things coming in. For example, um, some discussion on policy and often interdisciplinary perspectives if you had a second or subsequent course, simply because there was more scope to cover more than the um, basic or, or the requirements that um, accrediting bodies might have. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so... That's gone through or covered um, looking at it from a teaching perspective, moving on now to a research perspective. And I sort of ask a, a very fundamental question at the beginning is what is research? Because um, across disciplines, um, across people's experience, they might have different views. Uh, Borden's at Abbott in 2008 said that research is a means of not just acquiring knowledge, which is often what we might think it is, but it's also a way of thinking and of viewing the world. So that's sort of suggesting research isn't just about what you do in the outcomes, but it's about how you go about it. What worldview do you take? What methodology do you apply? What implicit um, assumptions are you making? Another way of looking at it is that research might be loosely classified between being basic or what some would call pure, and applied. And of course, those in our STEM subjects would generally say to us, oh, we do the pure, the real research, the basic. You guys in the business school and the social sciences, you're just doing applied. And that's something that's not as good. And so you need to have a reason to come back and say, well, maybe some of it is applied because we are trying to solve problems. But a lot of research that's done in social sciences is also basic or pure research. But I would say more of tax research, the majority of it, at least, seems to be more applied solving problems or raising issues rather than what I would call fundamental basic or pure research. But we're seeing more of that emerge. And this might also be something reflective of tax growing as a confidence that it really is a, a discipline. Um, again, talk to some people and they just think tax is 
uh, researchers just blackly the law analysis. You're just looking at cases, legislation, analysing it, whatever. And I hope most of us would accept tax researchers much more than that. We should be incorporating theories, testing them empirically, and am analysing what those results tell us. In terms of the thrusts that drive our research, I think it's fair enough to say that law and accounting are the two dominant ones. Um, but as time has gone on, and I see this myself as my career has developed, a lot more is coming from other disciplines like economics, history, political science, etc. So sometimes this is because academics and tax have had training or experience or work with colleagues in these disciplines, or in other times, somebody who's come from a discipline, for example, um, a psychologist, um, might have got really interested in tax and has actually moved into doing or undertaking tax-based research, bringing in the theories and perspectives from their discipline. Uh, Lamb and Lima in 1999, so this is quite some time ago, but still makes, I think, some very important statements to reflect upon. Saying, what do we mean by tax research in an accounting context? So obviously you can see that the context of this work is, where does tax fit within accounting? And they say, we include research that deals with taxation in the functional context of accounting practice, like financial reporting, auditing, managerial accounting, financial accounting, or tax accounting. And some, often our accounting colleagues would say, that's where we see tax fitting. It's just one part that fits in that supports accounting. They say, we also include tax research that contributes to academic literature on the measurement and reporting of accounting information, management and organisation of accounting functions, interactions between accounting information and capital market behaviour, individual financial decision making. So actually pushing it a little bit further than just supporting traditional accounting areas. And even at this time, remember this, this is quite some time ago, talking about 23 years ago, uh, this raises three key challenges to the researcher. First of all, the interdisciplinary nature of the problem requires the researcher to define carefully the nature of the particular problem under examination. Something you may have experienced yourself is the more you delve and look at a, a tax issue and want to think about it broadly, the more you realise different disciplines and perspectives provide valuable perspectives, information, approaches to analysing that problem. Um, secondly, the subject requires the researcher to work outside the core of the discipline. So in many ways, unless you are comfortable and want to stay in more traditional areas, as you get more and more involved into tax research, you need to work or draw upon ideas or things that go beyond the core of the discipline. And, and that may require some upskilling and understanding or working with colleagues in these other areas. And often as well, um, the, the researcher is working at the boundaries of the discipline where you're likely to need interdisciplinary perspectives and methods. So that's the bit of text, unfortunately, that's dropped off the bottom. So you're going to have to become very well read, um, take a lot of time to look at other perspectives, if need be, seek guidance or support of others to really be able to offer something that is going to significantly add to the research you're doing and potentially advance tax as I would argue, as a discipline that in itself, in some ways, is also interdisciplinary. Okay, next slide, please. Um, Hanlon and Heitzman in 2010 um, said that tax research can be difficult, not only because one has to follow tax studies in accounting, finance, economics, and law through academic institutions, governmental agencies, and policy think tanks, but also because different disciplines often use different languages and have different perspectives. One issue that has been raised is that tax research and accounting needs more theory. This is likely true. Almost every applied field could benefit from a stronger theoretical foundation. So just to unpack this for a minute or two, um, it supports some of the comments I made earlier that you actually need to, to do tax research, have quite a broad understanding and follow research in many disciplines. And this could include accounting, finance, economics, law, and you could add to that. Um, history, so sociology, psychology, et cetera, because they might have valuable things that are going to shape what you want to do. And you need to be following this through not just your traditional academic research, but often through governmental-based agencies, policy think tanks, et cetera. And if you're anything like me and you've tried to do that, other disciplines use their own 
nuances, different languages, different perspectives, different ways they the researchers talk to each other. And you need to sort of break that code to understand that in order to really be able to immerse yourself in that literature. So in one sense, this is saying that tax research can actually be a lot harder, more challenging, require a lot more thought and preparation than what would be if you were just in a traditional area of accounting, for example. They also talk about needing more theory, and this is often an issue that's not just about tax, but if your research is set field is, or discipline is seen as being much more applied rather than pure or theoretical, then there is this inclination not to immerse yourself enough initially in a theoretical foundation. And I tend to agree with this view that it is very important, even if you're using methods where um, the theory is well understood and it's nowhere near as um, complex and there's much unpacking, but you should still be clear what your theoretical perspective is when you're undertaking even applied-based research. Tyler in 2017 says that um, a lot of research, a lot of what's going on, we need to challenge our traditional approaches to legal research, including tax legal research. He emphasizes we need more theory, we need to use more models, we need to take into account social frameworks. And this, he argues, is if you're doing legal policy analysis, and this is one of the areas that certainly falls into my areas of research, means that you need to be looking well outside the traditional areas for guidance, inspiration, ideas, and things if you're going to undertake this type of research. You can't just um, work within the, the core areas that you might traditionally do so. Uh, Takema in 2018 said that socio, so, sorry, social legal and theoretical legal research is important, and these are clearly emerging areas with legal research being a blend of social sciences and humanities. So this is quite interesting that researchers are now really saying that in some ways, legal research isn't really constrained to just looking at uh, the case law and statutes and regulations, but we're actually blending things from other wider areas, such as social sciences and humanities. And says that by studying law as an existing practice, it may be said to share the descriptive an explanatory focus of social science. Okay, so if you're wanting to look at what's going on in practice, that's going to require you need to have a look at things from the social sciences. If you're going to make interpretive normative arguments, then you might need to go and look at normative humanities discipline, such as ethics or other things. So again, what it's saying is that rather than just constraining our research to some limited traditional areas, we need to potentially make it more impactful have it more influence that we need to be looking at wider disciplines, which means we need to immerse ourselves in those disciplines before we undertake our research. Uh, next slide, please. Um, another study by Lynn Oates, who's at Exeter University, um, she said that tax research is not known for its reflexivity and methodology is something we tend not to talk about much even in work where it assumes central importance, such as the capital markets-based work within tax accounting scholarship. Tax researchers come from a variety of disciplinary backgrounds and may have some research training acquired from that particular disciplinary perspective. What we often lack is an understanding of research approaches and methods from other disciplines. And when I read this some time ago and then I brought it in here, I said, this just reflects the way I felt my own perspective where I was and where I think a lot of people have been, when we look at our research over time and look at where our strengths are and where we have capacity to improve. And often it's been, we don't um, talk enough about methodology, even though it can be critical that the disciplines we come from highly influence what we do. And it almost pushes us away from thinking about looking at things from other perspectives, unless we take an active Measure, uh, steps to look at those. So what we need to do, and it's because, and I can say this for myself, if we don't understand some of the other approaches and methods and other disciplines, we tend to leave them aside. And we could be missing out on hugely beneficial ideas, things that will help to push tax re research on further. Um, the work by McCurcher, a book published in 2010, which is one that I make sure all of my PhD students need to read, um, because her work, I think, is one of the leading ones on how to design 
to conduct and report on research and taxation. She also covers law and accounting, but she was a tax-based person herself, and it's just a dynamitely useful piece of work. And one of the things in that work that she emphasizes is the pivotal nature of theory, and that often that is something that isn't fully developed or utilized the way it should in tax research. Now, another area, this is just an example in this next study by uh, Lisa Marriott at Victoria University in Wellington, is a growing area that happens in many disciplines, also happens in tax, is, and it was talked about earlier on about actively engaging students in research as part of doing our research, part of our teaching, is, well, what are some of the issues if we want to use students um, as subjects? Because students, or at least traditionally pre-COVID times, would be readily available, fairly easy to use a lecture class or something subject to human ethics approval as subjects for your research. And she concludes, well, if they are your population of interest, that's great. Um, so if you really are interested, and I did some work back in 2010 trying to understand whether the New Zealand tax rewriting process was improving understanding for students, well, I use my students at different year group levels because that's exactly what I wanted to test. However, if they are not your population of interest, so if they're a proxy for taxpayers generally, you need to interpret your results conservatively because students, particularly undergrad students, don't have a lot of real world experience. Whatever you do, you need to acknowledge the limitations. Um, so don't try and draw too much out of your findings. And if you're using experiments, this was a related area, then you need to have more interdisciplinary input. So don't just do it from your own. Make sure you're looking at things like from behavior, education, et cetera, when you're developing your ex experiments. So in drawing at this point um, together, um, this is my contention that tax research is moving towards maturity as research because we're starting to use theory more, you recognizing methodology, drawing upon other disciplines and areas. But, and I have to be, I think, be honest about this, the debate still continues whether tax in itself is a discipline or whether it's an interdisciplinary perspective that fits in a number of areas. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, the next few slides, a couple of slides here, are some examples of how um, over time we see, we've seen a number of specialist tax conferences or symposiums coming about by different regions. And now this is not exhaustive, so you may be aware of ones that I've missed out there. It's just to give an idea that over the last 20 to 30 years, and in some cases less than that, we're starting to see tax emerging from being either at an accounting conference or a law conference or something else to having its own conference. So within Australasia, and some of you may be familiar, there's the Australasian Tax Teachers Association, there's the International Tax Administration Conference that UNSW hosts, Queensland Tax Researchers Symposium that different universities in Queensland host each year. So they have emerged as being where tax academics, um, postgrad students, and in some case practitioners, um, come together when we're focusing on tax very broadly interpreted. Then within Europe, there's um, the Global Conference on Environmental Tax. There's um, the Institute for Austrian International Tax Law has a lot of conferences. IBFD has a lot of conferences. The International Fiscal Association has um, a lot of um, conferences as well. So that's just some examples there where there's a lot of conferences that are just focusing on tax. In North America, there's the American Taxation Association, which is part of the American Accounting Association. Oh, can you drop back to the previous slide, please? Um, um, and then Canada's got its own. And then there's also the National Tax Association, which is more for economists in the US. Within the UK, for example, Cambridge University has, a, has its own tax policy centre. It also runs a tax history conference. Uh, Oxford University has its own centre and runs a conference. There's the Tax Research Network, which is the UK equivalent of the Australasian Tax Teacher Association Conference. And then there's the Tax Administration Research Centre at Exeter that runs a conference. So there. And another one that's um, also run and is more through um, China, New Zealand, and it's been, I think it's been in Australia, is the International Conference on Chinese Tax and Policy um, that has a focus on tax issues that are of relevance to China. Okay, next slide, please. So in relation to the conferences, and I'm sure what most institutions 
say is arguably more important than the conference or symposium is the publication outlets. So what I'm showing here is, again, non-exhaustive examples of um, specialist tax journals. Many have been around now for 20, 30 years, some are more recent, but the growing number is indicative of more research that has got a tax focus to it needing to be disseminated. So within Asia, Asia Pacific Journal of Tax, Asia Pacific Tax Review are two. Australasia, we've got the Australian Tax Forum, Australian Tax Review, e-journal tax research, Journal of Australian Taxation, Journal of Australian Tax Teach Association, New Zealand Journal of Tax Law and Policy, which is the one that I'm the chair of the editors of, and the Revenue Law Journal. And then within Europe, we've got the Bulletin for International Tax, EC Tax Review, European Taxation, International Transfer Pricing Journal, International VAT Monitor, Intertax, and there's others. So there's quite a large number of specialist journals, but where the greatest number is, arguably, is in North America. And I won't go through them all there, but there's journals there which are accounting focused, law focused, and particularly a large number that are law focused. And if you recall earlier on, I said that when it comes to the major areas of tax, there's a lot greater influence that comes through legal trained academics than would come through our, our traditional accounting trained academics. And then in the UK, there's a number, including the British Tax Review, Corporate Tax Review, EC Tax Journal, Fiscal Studies. Okay, so next slide, please. So I've gone through quite a lot and in the time of talking about um, perspectives from teaching and research. So I wanna try and draw together some of the common observations from that. And once I've gone through this, then that will be the last slide before we um, go on to questions and comments. So what do I take away from all of this? That going back over the last 50 years, so the first study I talked about was about in 1970. Um, tax, the tax discipline, and again, I use that in quote marks because it's not um, necessarily settled that it is a discipline. It's been evolving. It's evolved from academics that tend to have a lonely life. They might be the only person in their institution and they're only doing tax as part of their work. Their background was largely uh, law and accounting, sometimes even a professional rather than an academic. And their courses were often electives. So you might not get many students at all. And in fact, it may not always be offered because not enough students want to do it. This has moved or evolved towards tax becoming core to accounting degrees, but still usually elective for law degrees, but still often a large, a reasonably large number of students taking it. And that reflects not only what I see at my university, but at quite a few others. We see now that specializations and tax are emerging, whether they're undergraduate majors, postgraduate majors, even specialist degrees. And the US has probably got the most of these, where um, you've got um, postgraduate law, where the even what we would call a bachelor's degree, the JD, is done at postgraduate, and then many specialist uh, masters of law degrees, LLMs, in tax. We've also seen that the teaching content is moving up beyond just going through legislation, regulations, cases, uh, particularly as more courses come on board to talking about policy issues and providing various disciplinary perspectives. So giving students uh, a more rounded view about tax. We also see the, the new area of SALT, the scholarship of learning and teaching, becoming an area of importance for a number of academics. It's not only a chance to enhance your teaching through the feedback, but also a chance to be publishing research, which again helps your research profile. If we move outside of law schools or law-based courses particularly, we see that the research tends to be much more interdisciplinary and incorporates theory and empirical analysis more often. Now, to be fair, in more recent years, we're starting to see what I would call research done in law schools, often becoming socio-legal, or at least looking at different perspectives other than our traditional Black Leaf Law methodology. The debate continues, and I don't know whether it will ever be resolved, I hope it is, uh, whether tax is a discipline in its own right. And again, if it's resolved, I hope it is that it is seen as a discipline, not just by tax academics and those working in the area, but by those in other areas. Because at the end of the day, we can all think, if you're in tax, what you think your discipline is, if it is one. It's the recognition from colleagues and others in other areas that we are a discipline, which I think is most important. There are many specialist conferences and journals emerged in the last 20 to 30 years for tax. So rather than 
tax academics trying to squeeze into general law journals, accounting journals or whatever, and struggling to get recognition or often having reviewers or editors not understanding the research with the specialist journals, it's not only given more prominence to tax, but I think has enhanced the opportunities for academics and postgrad students and others to actually publish. Now, having said all of this, uh, the research which is in the paper and also my presentation has got limitations, and there's quite a few of them, obviously. Now, I haven't undertaken a comprehensive empirical study of tax courses globally. That would be something that would have taken months and months. I would have needed a large budget. And to what extent that would have actually enhanced things, I don't know. So it's not that. It's, it's looking at an overview. It's looking at some examples. So I freely acknowledge that if a comprehensive study was done, I might get some different findings. I also haven't, and again, because the scope would be far too large, gone through and looked at individual research publications. So I've not gone to look at them. I've focused on commentaries of others, my perspectives and experience. So turning to the, the broad theme of the presentation, which was who cares about tax theory and why and the place of tax disciplines within academia. Um, personally, I do care about theory. I incorporate it into my teaching. So even when I, when I can, I sort of talk about under, trying to get students to understand it, what perspective we're looking at this. Um, it, and if it is a research it, study, um, what um, theories might be driving it. And then obviously in my research, I think it's important to set out the theory and methodology, even if it is more traditional type tax research. And I encourage my students, particularly all my postgrad students from honours, masters, PhD, to make sure whatever they're looking at, that they have a solid theoretical framework and that they understand um, a choice of theory, why they might use it, what its strengths and weaknesses are, etc. Okay, last slide, please. So that's got to the end of my formal part. And for those of you who are postgrad students, the um, top two cartoons might be something you can uh, relate very closely to. Um, and the bottom one, um, I would hope that's not the perspective that um, you see, or, but again, it may be that the students is the one that's holding everyone up and it's the academic who's got the easy life and the university's just after taking your money. Okay, I'll leave it there. I'm happy for the stop slide sharing now and happy for the, um, the questions, comments session. Yeah. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you so much for Irene for a very interesting discussion. I think we already have some question in the chat box, so I will um I will probably just with them in order. Okay, so the first question is from okay. Let me see. Okay, it's from Christian Agung Prasetyo. Um, so I think you already touched about this issue a little bit. So we've seen the rise of researchers using psychology um, to research tax. Do you think this uh, would still be the case in the future? Uh, I think you already like mentioned a little bit, like some people use like psychology, maybe when they use like experiment, sometimes I think they use like some um, yeah. psychology theory. So uh, what's your take on this? Um, well, yeah, I mean, I can only hope that um through the, the breadth of backgrounds that students have that come and do tax. So probably not so much at undergrad, but certainly at postgrad, if we get students who have had some, maybe some undergrad experience beyond accounting or law, maybe they've done psychology, sociology or something else, they can see how that can help inform uh, different perspectives on tax and bring that in. And equally from academics, so if, when we're doing anything, particularly at postgrad and to maybe a limited degree, if you've got scope an undergrad where you might have what I would call an elective course where you've got more flexibility rather than being constrained by professional bodies content that you can start introducing students to saying, well, actually tax, for example, is a lot more than law cases and having to account for it. There's all these things. There's taxpayer behavior. Um, there's understanding how it's changed over time. There's policy. Why were these choices made, et cetera? So you suddenly open students up to getting an understanding that tax isn't what some people perceive as boring and very technical 
but in fact, it, it's got so much going for it. It can fit with anything. It's well informed. Um, that it's amazing how, and I've had this with my students. I said I never thought about tax from that perspective, and that's really opened my eyes up. And now I see something that I might want to go and look at. Okay, thank you, Adrian. Um, so I think we can move to the second question. So the second question is from Krista. So Krista is actually like one of my students at the doctoral program at UE. So uh, the question is, each country's tax law is different. So should tax research uh, also should tax research be carried out in a single country or in multiple countries? So I I probably have a you know a good sense of why these questions okay. <laughs> uh -huh. That's good. um so yeah so it's just basically um you know when you do like accounting research sometimes they said oh don't just use like indonesian contacts but use like asian use like international right like um you know like a wider audience but when it comes to tax then sometimes it's difficult when you want to t talk about like tax policy in asian for example then you know they have different tax regulation so, you know, basically we have to like really focus on like a certain country just to make sure that, you know, you don't really, you, you cannot generalize everything, right? So, um, so I think that that's where this question comes from. I think like a lot of my students ask, uh, is it okay to just use like Indonesia, you know, in my research, will, can I publish my research if it only talk about like one single country? So I think that's where this question comes from. No, you, and that's a great question. And in fact, it's something I get from some of my students and I also pose the question to them to see what they think. So I got several degrees or scale of answer. The first is the scale or the level. So if a student was doing some research, for example, for a small project undergrad versus doing something at postgrad like honours or a master's paper or a PhD, my answer is very different. So the scope of the, what they can do, their knowledge, where they're at, it's going to be a lot more limited, particularly at an underground level, at undergrad level. And I don't sometimes, for example, when I teach ethics and tax, I might get them to compare a couple of jurisdictions where I've taught that just so they get an understanding that some things are similar and some things are different. But if I'm talking about more technical things like understanding the law or cases, I would tend to stay in one jurisdiction because it's very hard unless the two jurisdictions uh, have got some common base to actually compare them. But once I get further up, I'm saying where you can add more value, you can get more insights, is don't just look at one jurisdiction, choose another jurisdiction, but have a good reason why. Now, it might be because the two of them have got something that's quite distinct, but they do something in a different way. And by looking at them, you get to get insights to see that maybe this policy choice versus this policy choice. Or you might want to compare, and I have this a lot with a lot of my international PhDs who come from maybe an Asian country, they'll pick their country in New Zealand because they're studying here, and that gives them a contrast between a common law country and a country with a different legal system, often between a developed and a developing country, also a country that might have a more mature tax in this area compared to another. So it gives rich insights to be able to do it. But the more you compare or use more than one country, it restricts how deep you can go or just how broad you can go because suddenly your research can get out. But I know something I was told some years ago um, when I was sort of more junior academic saying, don't just publish and tax on your own jurisdiction, even though that's what people think is all you can do. If you can do uh, cross-cultural or cross-country or whatever, not only are you going to add more knowledge, but potentially you've got a better chance to publish outside your home country. And for us anyway, publishing in overseas highly ranked journals is perceived much more important than our local journals. And so if you've only done New Zealand, unless it's something that's really interesting, unique, that say a North American journal is interested in, the first response is our readers aren't interested in that, go away. So you to make yourself potentially of interest, you need to think about where you're targeting it, how you can add some value. And I always think potentially you can add more value through comparison and contrasting rather than just looking at one thing, particularly, as I said, if it's big enough. So if it's a master's paper or a PhD, potentially yes, but not for a smaller project. Sorry, that's a long answer, but I can't give a simple answer because it all depends on the circumstances. 
Yeah, I think that's that's a really great answer, Adrian. Um, so trying to find like a different jurisdiction with maybe mm. legal system, the legal system is different, or like you know the like developed mm. or developing country. I think that that will add to uh, add values to the findings, right? So mm. when you have these two country, how your result will be um, different, or maybe it will be similar. So what what that's can right. you, you don't know, include? but you've got a yeah, chance yeah. to the contrast, yeah. Yes, yes. Um, thank you so much, Adrian, for your answer. Um, so Frista, if you have additional question, uh, you can post it again on the chat box, or maybe uh, later if we have time, you can ask uh, Professor Adrian yourself. Okay, so we'll move to the next question. So this is from Putra Adi Shani. Uh, the question is, since taxation is multidisciplinary approach, um, so basically, can we conclude that uh, taxation doesn't have a grand theory? Ah, that's it. That's a that's a great question, which um, I've been asked and I've asked my students saying, well, surely if we want to prove that we are a discipline, that somehow we can find a grand theory. And then I say to them, OK, take a discipline that's well known. Do they have a grand theory? Um, and usually they don't. Um, and another question I've often asked students when it comes to um, tax and particularly tax compliance is, can you actually, for example, conclusively tell me what it means to be compliant or non-compliant? And you can get examples and that, and it depends on the perspectives. Um, and, uh, and probably the best example I give is, okay, imagine the Ministry of Finance asks you to come up with a new tax, and it wants you to maximise all of the criteria for a good tax. Okay, can you do that to maximise all the criteria? And they start thinking, and oh, but equity usually has a trade-off against um, efficiency, whatever. And I said, that's it. Um, in many things, there is no grand theory. We've only got um, a proximate idea for something, or we've got our best working knowledge at this point. So I'd love to be proven wrong that there is a grand theory. I don't believe there is. But if somebody can find one that covers everything, well, that's fantastic. But I just don't see us going that way, partly because tax is so broad. And, but partly, even if you take one aspect of it, in itself, it's so complex to have one grand theory to answer everything. I just don't think it's feasible. Great, thank you, Adrian. Okay, so let's move to the next question. Oh, so I think this is the question from your student. Yes, Manga, yes. <laughs> yes, and which is also like one of our lecturer. So in terms of tax teaching, since taxation mainly becomes part of accounting or low discipline or curriculum, um, to what extent should lecturers, especially in um, in the accounting program, introduce multidisciplinary perspective of taxation to students through teaching taxation courses? So I will just give you a, a sense of like what Hanga experienced while uh, he was teaching, you know, at uh, my university. So in our accounting program, it's more um, probably like um, a, a mix of conceptual, but conceptual is just like basically like the the the, the basic uh, taxation. Um, you know, like Adam Smith uh, yep. and uh, the rules, you know, like uh, basic tax and uh, low understanding. And then uh, mostly in the, our accounting program, we focus on the computational uh, and how to, mm. how to like uh, interpret or um, use tax uh, understanding in like making accounting or business decisions. So that's, that's how our curriculum right now for uh, the accounting program. So I think um, on the question, expand to like what should we do uh, when when panga comes back <laughs> so what what how should we you know revamp our um syllabus our way of uh, teaching taxation for you okay, know preparing well, the future generation yes this is a huge question for which is dangerous to wade into it too much <laughs> because it's got varying levels of how it might work so assuming that in the short to medium term you can't dramatically change your broad approach to the curriculum that might be mandated by professional bodies or whatever. So if you wanted to change that, you have to make a strong case to why other things are needed, why this is important for the skills attributes of your graduates. So let's say, what can you do in the shorter term? And let's say you talked about the example of maybe we use Adam Smith. Well, you could introduce the students saying, okay, let's just think for a minute, where does Adam Smith come from? What's the context of Adam Smith? When was it written? What were things like? Okay, and now we are here in 2022. To what extent is the world the same today as it was in Adam Smith's days? 
are there other things that um, we should think about? And one of the big things to think about is, is tax in itself isolated or is tax somehow related to the fact that it produces revenue for the government? It doesn't just collect revenue for the sake of revenue, it collects it because it wants to use it for various programs, which might be education, social policy, whatever. So it's starting to think, okay, how should tax maybe reflect or support things like social policy? And then suddenly you need to get the students thinking about other perspectives. So it's just introducing them, not comprehensively at that point, but introducing them to understand why do we use this? What's the context? Has the context changed? Where are we? And where is Indonesia? Because Adam Smith's not Indonesia. Adam Smith is England um, centuries ago. Um, so I think that's what you can, you can be brave enough to do little things like that. But then the bigger issue is when you've been exposed to other areas to think, OK, within what we have to do, can we deliver it in a different way? Um, can we expose other ideas to our students while still making sure the core things that we have to cover are covered? And I think in some ways, good teachers also reflect their own personality in the way that they teach, the way they bring things in, the way they choose to do things, rather than appearing to be no more than a textbook that's speaking, if you know what I mean. Um, if you, you can sort of bring your experiences say, look, you know, this might be it is, but, you know, why is it like this? Why did we make these choices in Indonesia? You know, should we reflect on them differently today? So you're getting the students to think while at the same time still making sure that they are aware of what they that they need to cover. But you have to have confidence in yourself for those other things and then be willing to answer their questions because it will get debate and discussion. And if that's what you want to get from your students, then that's good. But it's a bit like, opening up a box and not knowing what's going to come out of it. Okay, great. Um, thank you, Adrian, for your answer. So, uh, Panga, if you have additional questions, you can still like, uh, okay. So, he said, thank you. <laughs> okay, um, so um, I don't, uh, okay, so I have here my uh, question from EOC, Sepriani. Um, this is also like one of uh, my uh, PhD students. So um, the question is, uh, would you suggest uh, the best way of how to identify and incorporate the theory? Uh, I think, uh, Adrian, you mentioned about uh, sometimes tax research use you know, various theory from other fields, right? So the question here is uh, how to identify them and how to incorporate that, them. No, that's a very good practical question and something all of my PhD students, either they may have themselves have ideas or I need to give them things to start thinking about. So a few things to think about is, well, what do you want to do on your research? Okay, so do you want to stick within what we might call traditional black letter law analysis? And you, and you think that that is the way to answer your proposed research questions, problems or whatever? Um, that's fine. But then I'd say, well, is that enough? Or is that going to satisfy you? Is that going to produce the new contributions? And then you might say, well, I'm also interested in the policy choices behind these things. I said, okay, right, now we need to think about if you were to do policy-based research, what sort of theories, ideas, perspectives do people do that? And don't they happen to be in tax. You could go and look at some other area and you say, well, maybe I have to understand political theory. Or maybe I have to understand, um, when I look at this, what are some of the things? I might have to understand some economic policy development. I might have, if it's something that's driven from different social policy areas, or am I interested more in the behavior? How do people react to this? Therefore, I might have to go and look at sociology, psychology, et cetera. Or maybe I'm interested in how something's evolved over time. So I might have to go and look in anthropology or at least in historical. And then once you've got your perspective, then you need to immerse yourself in what are the sort of theories, methodologies that are used there. So tax has very, I don't know if tax has anything unique to tax. It draws upon all these other disciplines and areas. And so in that sense, tax is wonderfully rich because it can draw upon those things. Um, but you then have to go and immerse yourself in them. And so, uh, and for example, Panga knows through his experience of sort of learning about education side of things and having to look at that and then learning about um, theories that might fit it. And one of the theories that I get my students to talk about a lot if they're looking at things that might be happening by tax authorities or governments is to think, for example, about institutional theory. And then when they look at institutional theory, they find 
that there's a lot of different views and perspectives and how it's evolved. So they then need to dig down to find out is one of those perspectives going to work? And then maybe you find it doesn't fit and you have to go and look at another theory. So um, there's going to be a lot of iteration, a lot of thought, a lot of discussion with supervisors, um, but ultimately wanting to get the best combination of things that are going to maximise your chances to be able to answer your research questions or problems to be able to make a valuable contribution to knowledge. Okay, thank you, Adrian. That's a really interesting answer. Um, so um, anybody else? And Yossi, if you still have a question, you can still like post it on the chat box. Anybody, um, if you want to raise your hand, that's also fine. We still have like um, some time uh, if you have additional questions. Um, so while waiting for our participant to ask questions, so I probably just want to ask you. Um, so one of the things, I, I mean, it's good that you list like all the text journals, because sometimes I get questions from, um, you know, usually doctoral students, like where to, where to publish. And uh, one of the things about this uh, text journal, like some of my students say, that, oh, they have a really low impact factor, you know, it's just like uh, and people want a journal with like high citation. And can you like give us a sense? And since you already mentioned that uh, maybe this is like a, an area that not like uh, many people, it's, it's different with like financial accounting, for example, right? Or um, like auditing. Uh, so this is probably just like a more um, specialized area and even like people who write in low journal probably won't target uh, you know, like accounting journal and, and vice versa, right? So, um, so what do you think will be the best way to publish uh, if you want to be recognized as a tech scholar, like internationally? Okay. Well, so that's, uh, so that, that's to, my question. I'll try and answer that in a few minutes rather than an hour or more. Um, and these are my views, and my views don't necessarily accord with what other people have. So a few points. First of all, if we think about people who do tax research, we're relatively small. Okay, That's people who are what I call predominantly a tax person rather than maybe a financial accountant who looks at deferred tax, for example, which I still believe is an accounting person who's looking at some branch of accounting that interrelates with tax. So we're a relatively small group. So there's not going to be as many people researching. So there's going to be less opportunities for people to cite people's work because a lot of impact factors and whatever is based on, you know, citations, based on um, different views. So, and when you're small, you're going to struggle. Secondly, what some people choose to do is saying, well, there are not many tax journals that are high, got high impact factors or highly rated in Shimago or anything like that. So they'll go to specialist accounting journals, law journals, or whatever that do have a higher ranking and say, well, I want to get in there because I'm most concerned. And then I say, if you to get in there is often harder because often those journals, the editors or referees aren't really interested in tax or don't see it their main readership. But let's imagine you make it. Great. Then the issue comes is how much impact is your research going to have on the people that you want to read it? Well. Most tax people probably read less specialist accounting journals or whatever. So maybe you have achieved one of the aims that your institution wants, that is, it's a higher impact journal. But at the end of the day, my personal view is a lot of these metrics suit certain people, suit certain disciplines, but do they really benefit society in the long run? Because as academics, postgraduate students, our job, using public money in most cases, is to make valuable contributions to improve society. And if virtually no one other than you, the referees and the editors are ever going to read your work, what benefit does that really make? Now, you can only do that to some extent because, you know, if, you, if your institution, say, for promotion or whatever says you have to have so many articles and high-ranked journals, it becomes a battle of meeting certain metrics at the expense of what I believe in the long run is far better, is having an impact on the people in your discipline and on wider society. So you sort of have to say to new academics, and this is where I think life's so hard compared to when I started, is you do have to get runs on the board. You do have to get in good journals. So sometimes you have to compromise what might be the best outlet for the readership to try and get it in a journal that has got a higher impact factor, better ranking or whatever, so that you're going to satisfy the other metrics that are there. So I have to be pragmatic. Well, personally, I think that is in the long run not what we should be about. And I know the debates are still going on 
about to what extent is impact important and then how do you measure it? And our, numer- our quantitative people say it's all about impact factors and all that. But I say, well, is that really what impact's only about? How have you changed society? How have you influenced policymakers? You can't see those things in general impact factors. Um, but you might better find them um, in, in some other area. So if, though, we see more and more tax academics and uh, grad students and others publishing in good tax journals, and eventually we get more citations, those journals will gradually start to move up and get higher impact factors. So the only way to improve those ultimately is to support them more, get more high quality publications, more citations. But that's a long journey. That's decades to happen. Whereas if you are now and you're wanting a job, you're wanting a promotion, you need to think about the here and now. So you might have to, what I perceive, compromise what's better for the long run in order for something that's going to benefit you or your institution in the short run. And I have this battle at my institution where they say, well, not many of your journals are ranked high in Chimago, but if we use the ABDC, which I'm sure you're probably familiar with, most of my publications are in A or A star journals. And I point out to them, to get an A star in ABDC, you've got about a 7% chance. To get the equivalent of an A star in Chimago, you've got a 25% chance. So who's got the harder road to go? And they shut up at that point because, but they then say, well, but Chimago is what it is. It's all about that. And I say, that's fine. But smaller disciplines just don't get the same sort of um, opportunity. So that's slightly long, but not too long sort of answer of one way that I would approach that. But I'm lucky. I'm a professor. I've been around a while. I can make choices that I think might be better for society rather than be too worried about impact factors if I'm looking to try and get promoted or get appointed or whatever. Okay, thank you, Adrian. And I think that's a really great point um, that, you know, we ourselves have to support the tax journals, right? Mm. I mean, we have to read them and we have to, um, you know, cite them because I kind of, I kind of feel like sometimes people just don't, don't read uh, the, like the specialized tax mm. journals and maybe it's just because um, we don't like introduce them. I mean, like maybe in Indonesia, we don't like introduce them enough uh, to students to actually like go to mm. those journals and focus on, like you say, maybe the high impact, uh, more general journal that mm. probably listed uh, higher in Simago, right? Uh, but there's mm. actually um, a lot of other good tax journals, especially uh, when it comes to the Australasian. I think you have a great community that really specialized in. We're, in we're, yeah, we're very fortunate, and that's grown up over the last 20, 25 years. That it actually supports the academics and the postgrad students really well. And I've compared going to like the AFAMS conference, Accounting Finance Association, I used to early on. I stopped because tax virtually dropped out of it. And the way that I found certain academics and, and uh, postgrad students were often treated by senior academics was so appalling and devastating for them, it killed their careers. Um, so it was actually about scoring points where it, um, the Australasian tax teachers, for example, and the TRN in the UK, we are very supportive because we all have a common problem. We're ostracized from our accounting or law of other colleagues. We're seen as, oh, you're those tax people. And so we, we do have to work to support each other. And I think the discipline's growing, the postgrad students and hopefully um, ones that um, have experience like ATRA or whatever would feel that they benefit as part of a community. They can talk to professors and others and feel that they're going to be valued and supported rather than made to feel that you're just a postgrad student and I'm a professor. Um, and you mind your place, which is often the way it feels in some of the other conferences. Yeah, I, I've heard of the great support system for um, students in, you know, interested in doing the tax research in Australia and New Zealand. So hopefully in Indonesia, we can also uh, do the same. And I will probably like encourage my students to, you know, just look at the conferences in yep. Australia and in New Zealand. And there will be a lot of people who is like doing well, a yeah, tax research. Yeah, certainly before COVID, like yeah. um, as I had a lot of people come from Indonesia, which was fantastic. Yes. Yeah. So I loved the fact that we actually, even though it's called Australasia, it was really Asia, uh, Australasia, if you know what I mean. And that was great. Yes. But unfortunately, COVID's made that a bit harder. Yeah, yeah. So hopefully we can, you know, uh, we can 
travel back to um, where the conference is yeah. in, in, in New Zealand or in Australia or in other part of Asia. Um, yeah. Thank you, Adrian. I think that that's a really um, relieving um, answer because sometimes people just, you know, like they have doubt about like, oh, should I, you know, go to that uh, text um, journals? And well, they know that, you know, the readership seems like match with the paper, but um, you know, like looking at metrics and stuff. But like you say, impact is not something that's written on on the website or on paper, but like how you really influence like policy or, um, you know, like uh, people like academics like you. Yeah, um, particularly okay, so when we're in applied, largely an applied discipline. I think that's fair to say rather than most of our research is more applied than pure. So we are looking at how we're shaping society. Okay. Yes. Thank you, Adrian. So we have here Alamin, Jesse. Um, so uh, she said that uh, I definitely agree with you, Professor, if we are focused on giving value or contributing to the society rather than who evaluates our journals, I think we can make influence, a change in the way tax is perceived. Yes. Mm. So, well, that's, that's, uh, yeah, that, that's a, a great comment. And I think that's particularly when you become you know, a bit more senior in the tax area, that it's not just about developing yourself or whatever, but it's actually how we can show that tax is offering so much more than just, um, you know, publishing in these high impact journals, but we're making valuable contributions to society, we're shaping it, we're hoping to understand things that are there. And in some cases, we might be called upon to advise governments, advise officials, or, or, or whatever. And, and, I, and if someone says, well, that's just because you don't have any high impact journals by that, I'm saying, no, that's not the reason we're doing it, because we believe there's a greater mission behind tax research than just getting stuff published in what are perceived to be the high impact journals. Yes, great. I, I think that's a really important point. So. Okay, um, so do we have anybody who want to raise their hands or want to add some comments or questions to Adrian? Okay, if not, then I actually still have my question for you. So this is uh, in my capacity as the, uh, the new chair of the accounting department. So, uh, and I already mentioned how we craft our syllabus. And I know, um, Adrian, you come from a really interesting background because you're an accounting professor, but I know you uh, you got your doctoral degree in uh, basically law, right? Uh, from University of Virginia. Yep. Um, so what do you think, like how much low uh, content we should put in our um, you know tax uh, courses for let's just say like undergraduate level like um, how much and what um, maybe what subject what low subject do you think will be like the most crucial for them to uh, understand before they start like looking at the specific tax law okay so I'll deal with it first of all if you were a law student um, and and doing and doing law when we because we also teach the tax paper in the law school here at the university so we do the basics the same but then we focus on issues that we believe are more importance to lawyers um, and things where they get involved and if it's the same area we 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 look at it as though you were a lawyer approaching the issue more than if say you were an accountant so so we so the courses are not the same and we allow the students who are law or accounting. Um, to do both courses, um, and most of them say, yeah, we can certainly see some of the differences and it gives us different perspectives. But to focus on the accounting students, which is the vast majority that we have, um, we have a couple of constraints. The first is that the professional bodies in New Zealand specify the core areas and, and to some degree what you need to cover. 